Okay, uh, uh, shall we start? Uh, Assalamu'alaikum and uh, very good afternoon to everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Prof. Roslinda for uh, for the kind introduction, uh, as well as uh, Boringer and Galhum for arranging this afternoon's uh, webinar. Uh, I've actually been given the task of, uh, of presenting two uh, cases. Uh, in fact, these two cases were provided to me by Boringer and Angalham. What I did was just uh, tweak the two cases a bit, and then uh, yeah, and then we'll see uh, uh, how uh, what you all feel about those two cases. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. This is the first case. Uh, it's a uh, Mr. Er. He's a 53-year-old man who presents with symptoms of ankle swelling breathlessness and fatigue. Uh, he was promptly admitted for further evaluation. He had no symptoms of hypoglycemia before. Uh, past history, uh, uh, dose of type 2 diabetes over the last 10 years, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He's obese with a BMI of 32, weight of 84 kg. Uh, unfortunately, he had an AMI five years ago, though he had had no symptoms of chest pain since then, yeah? And listed are his current medications. Um, yeah, as you can see for diabetes, he's taking metformin, glycoside, and for his cardiac condition, he's on bisoprolol, uh, peridopril for hypertension, spironolactone, yeah? Uh, Rosuvastatin for his uh, lipids, and he's also on frusamide. So uh, based on the medications, we know that uh, he's been having uh, heart failure, and which uh, explain the fact that he's on Lasix. Yeah? Okay, uh, these are his uh, uh, these are his uh, vital signs as well as his uh, basic uh, blood investigation results. Uh, blood pressure uh, one o six sixty. Uh, fasting blood sugar slightly raised, ranging from 7.5 to 8.2. His A1C is 7.8 percent. Yeah, also slightly raised. Yeah, and creatinine is smack at 1 to 5. Yeah, meaning is uh, is on the verge of uh, CKD yeah? or at least CKD stage three. GFR calculated by EPI CKD method it was uh, 56, and urine analysis shows three plus of uh, protein. Uh, echo showed an infarcted and scut left uh, anterior descending artery territory with ejection fraction of 30 to 40 percent. So he is, uh, he has uh, what? Uh, uh, low ejection fraction. He has um, reduced ejection fraction and no demonstrable ischemia seen. Okay. Uh, we're going to open the uh, audience, uh, the questions for audience to reply, uh, to respond. Yeah, uh, he has progressive uh, symptoms of breathlessness. Yeah, he has been having uh, heart failure for quite some time, uh, with deterioration of uh, you know LV function of twenty six percent in 20, 2018. He remained in stage three New York heart classification. He was admitted three times. Frequent admissions for heart failure. So. Uh, just, uh, uh, Dr. Haman, I hope you don't mind. Uh, we revised a bit of our heart failure guideline or therapy. Yeah, so based on a guideline directed medical therapy, what would you do to optimize the treatment for his heart failure? So those are the options. If his heart rate is above 70, you uh, push up the dose of bisoprolol. If the heart rate is above 70, you add uh, evabradine. If heart rate is less than 70, you switch perinatal pre and trestor, yeah, to prevent sudden death and so on. If his heart rate is above 70, titrate up by the prolol and switch perinatal pre and trestor. And if the heart rate, finally, if the heart rate is above 70, add ibabridine and switch perinatal pre and trestor. Okay, shall we see the response? I can't see the I can't uh, see the, oh, there we are. Okay, so uh, those are the responses. Uh? Uh, majority of you, yeah, uh, chose to, uh, if the heart rate is above 70, yeah, you choose to optimize or push up the dose of isoprolol. 
and switch panel print width and transistor. I believe this is the most uh, appropriate uh, need, yeah, uh, 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 step. And the second uh, popular choice is that uh, uh, add Evaridine and switch panel here. Yeah. So D and E are, are uh, actually tackling the, the two issues there. Yeah, it's just that one, uh, the D option is trying to optimize by Soprolo to try and get it to uh, hard to go below 70, whereas uh, those who chose uh, option E uh, feels that is uh, rather than do that, just add in Ibabradine to, uh, to help uh, reduce the likelihood of sudden death. Yeah, okay, shall we move on? Right, now, next question. Uh, Right, okay. What would be the optimal A1C target for Mr. ER? Remember, this chap had AMI five years ago, and now he has, uh, you know, recurrent admission, recurrent hospitalizations for heart failure. And we uh, we have just optimized his heart failure therapy by uh, uh, adding ibabradine as well as switching uh, uh, the bus or, or adding in uh, 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 entrastor. Uh? Okay, now if you look at the response, uh, majority of you, yeah, 49%, nearly half of you believe that seven is the appropriate uh, target for his A1C. Yeah? And uh, yeah, I tend to agree with, uh, with, uh, what? with uh, seven. Yeah? Although those of you who, who are going for 6.5 may, may have your reasons. Yeah? Your reasons perhaps, uh, I believe, if I heard for those of you who would go for 6.5, I believe your reason might boil down to the fact that this patient has never had hypoglycemias before. Yeah, he never had hypoglycemias before. So why should we be too concerned about uh, lifting up the target A1C to 7? So that might be your, I, I believe that might be your reason. Yeah, plus, of course, uh, those proponents of uh, preventing heart, uh, Preventing uh, nephropathy, worsening of CKD would always say that uh, you know tight glycemic control, six point five would slow down microvascular complication. Yeah. So, but in general, based on the ACCORD study, yeah, ACCORD study is the one that that influenced a lot of our decision regarding target A one C. So, in this case, ACCORD study would say would agree that seven to seven point five would be the uh, target for patients with, uh, with previous CVD and heart failure, yeah? Okay, uh, now we go to the next slide. Uh, okay, the next slide deals with, uh, I'm sorry though, because uh, I've got the results of the previous uh, survey, it's blocking my view. <laughs> but anyway, uh, okay, got to get rid of that. So remember his fasting blood sugar was 7.5 to 8.2, his A1C is 7.8%. How would you optimize? So the next question, this will be our question number three. What would you, how would you optimize the type two diabetes management of Mr. ER? Yeah, number one, option one, add DP4 inhibitor in view of overt proteinuria. Yeah, there are studies to show that DPP4 may help with proteinuria. And SGLT2 inhibitor in view of CCF. Number C, add basal insulin to lower fasting hyperglycemia. He did have a slightly raised uh, uh, fasting blood glucose. D, initiate basal bolus insulin for tight overall glycemic control. Okay. And E, stop glycoside and replace with SGLT2 inhibitor for heart failure and to avoid hypoglycemia as a result of CKD stage 3. Okay, now if we look at the uh, the response so far, yeah, the uh, highest, uh, uh, what, uh, most of you voted to uh, for option E, which is to replace SGLT2, to replace, sorry, to replace glycoside with SGLT2, uh, primarily for the heart failure, yeah, because SGLT2 for heart failure, and to avoid hypoglycemia as a result of CKD stage 3, yeah. The second, uh, most popular option is to add SGLT2 in view of the uh, diagnosis of heart failure. Now, uh, okay, uh, right. Okay, let's discuss the, uh, the, what, the last response. Yeah, the last response. You guys remember that his A1C was actually 7.8%. 
if you do a direct switch, yeah, you switch Dimacron, which is a potent, uh, powerful drug, yeah, uh, uh, sulfonylurea, you switch with SGLT2, which has modest uh, A1C efficacy, you're going to end up with slightly raised A1C. Yeah, his A1C is not going to remain at 7.8. Uh, you know, based on our experience, it might go above 8. Yeah, it might go above 8. So, uh, so that could be one of the problem with option number 5. Although, uh, rightly so, uh, by switching a uh, SGLT2 with, I mean, by, you know, by switching the glycoside with uh, SGLT2, uh, you would reduce hypoglycemia. But I think um, if you look at the history, he himself did not have any history of hypoglycemia before. So, so perhaps those who want to retain glycoside may be justified in saying that let's retain glycoside uh, in view of the fact that he never had hypoglycemia before. Yeah. Okay. So uh, either option should be fine. It's just that uh, option E may uh, inadvertently result in a slightly raised A1C. Yeah. Okay. So we go to the next slide. Okay, well, I switch off the re result of the survey. Okay, so uh, yeah, um, what would be the optimal target? So we have discussed this just now. I'm trying to move the slide. Slide seems to, my computer seems to have jammed. Okay, yeah. So now this is, uh, yeah, this is a study. Yeah, or actually it's a meta-analysis of five uh, RCT uh, involving close to 33,000 patients with type 2. These are studies such as advanced, accord, so on and so forth, eh? they are where, whereby they did meta-analysis. And what the meta-analysis showed was that uh, intensive versus standard glucose control has, uh, uh, you know, it has some effect on improvement or reducing uh, in the incidence of MI, but it has no uh, influence on mortality or on heart failure. Yeah, I think this is well known. Yeah? We know very well that uh, uh, previous RCTs did not show any benefit, any uh, mortality benefit, and definitely not uh, heart failure. Issue of heart failure in diabetes only surfaced in the last three or five years, especially with the uh, introduction of SGLT2 in our diabetes armamentarium. Okay, yeah. Uh, now, so yeah, ideally it should be seven. If it can be reached safely, 7.5 is acceptable. Yeah? So we've discussed this and uh, optimized diabetes management. We've discussed uh, the, what, the benefit of adding SGLT2, especially in someone with intractable cardiac failure. Now, these are uh, the three studies uh, involving various SGLT2 inhibitors. I think Prof. Norlela have discussed this before and, and Dr. Hamad also touched on, on them. Yeah, what it showed was that what is consistent is that SGLT2 as a class, yeah, reduces heart failure, hospitalization for heart failure, and reduces uh, 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 heart failure uh, and as well as CV death. Uh, we got to remember the guys here yeah, that over the last, you know, about the last 10 years, remember majority, two thirds, 70% of diabetes going to succumb to cardiovascular disease. Yeah. See, uh, a decade or two decades ago, majority of that CV death is attributed to acute coronary event. Yeah, but with the advent of numerous intervention, drug therapy, double antiplatelet, all sorts of thrombolytic therapy, uh, well, uh, aggressive uh, uh, what PCI balloon stand, all those bioelutes, so on and so forth. So. Uh, so there has been a significant improvement in the management of acute coronary event resulting in less death. But what happens in the meantime is that death arising from heart failure yeah, is becoming more and more prominent as a result of improvement in the management of acute coronary syndrome, yeah, ACS. So, so it is not surprising then that if you do something to heart failure, you treat heart failure, you manage heart failure adequately, yeah, you do something, you improve CV death. 
Yeah, I think this is what we are seeing from these three uh, from these three studies. Yeah, okay, and uh, yeah, and as you know, uh, uh, the risk of heart failure or CV death uh, is uh, consistent uh, among those with pre-existing heart disease, and even in those without previous heart disease or especially without previous heart failure. Yeah, uh, those with high risk heart failure. Uh, when given as the attitude seems to uh, reduce their chance likelihood of hospitalization as well as CV death. Yeah, um, uh, we just need to highlight. I think some of you did ask this question. Well, uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening to Prof. Leila and and Dr. Ahmad. I was busy answering some of the questions that were posed by our by our viewers. Yeah? And one of them even asked about this initial drop in EGFR. Eh? Yeah. The reason why there's a drop because uh, SGLT2 is essentially a diuretic. Yeah, uh, it is perhaps not as potent as loop, but it's essentially a diuretic, and and therefore you get initial hypo uh, 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 diuresis, and that to a certain extent can lead to a slight reduction in GFR. Yeah. Uh, in the range of three, three, two to three units of GFR. Yeah? But these are transient. Quickly over a six month period, the GFR uh, goes back to normal and beyond six months, you get, you begin to see improvement. Yeah. Uh, the thing about the diuretic effect of SGLT2 is very dependent on glucose level. Yeah, very dependent. Uh, I just uh, finished doing my agent clinic just now before before I uh, yeah turn up to this web webinar. So one of my patients, he he likes uh, SGLT2 because it helps him to uh, you know lose weight, but he's complaining about his frequent urination, and I told him the reason why the urination is still an ongoing problem for him yeah is because his blood sugar continue to be high yeah so. You know, if you bring down your blood sugar, then you would see improvement in the urination, in the diuretic effect of SGLT2. Yeah? Although we know SGLT2 excrete two molecules of glucose, yeah, uh, prevent the, re uh, the reabsorption of two molecules of glucose uh, together with one molecule of sodium, studies done by our master's candidate, yeah, uh, Dr. Lingus Vari, yeah, with Prof. Norashikian, showed that the loss of sodium in the urine is transient and this is also reported by other studies yeah it is transient but the loss of glucose in the urine is quite consistent even a month even six months down the road it is uh, uh, glucose is still excreted and of course the amount is dependent on the prevalent uh, blood sugar level yeah uh, okay so we have answered this yeah uh, best is to uh, add SGLT2 and try uh, to lift the uh, what the uh, the uh, the glycoside still leave the glycoside behind uh, in order to pre not to allow the A1C to go up. Okay, this is our second case uh, in the next seven minutes. Okay, uh, uh, this is a case of a newly diagnosed type two diabetes who presented with acute coronary syndrome. Uh, who happened to have a normal renal function. This is Mr. AB, age 47, another young chap. Yeah? Presents with acute onset of left-sided ischemic chest pain. He's been a smoker for, yeah. Um, not known to be diabetic, father had a history of type 2 diabetes and, uh, and succumbed in his 70s. He's also uh, overweight with a BMI of 26. And these are his 12 lead ECG on uh, admission or in A&E. Okay, now I want you all, this is a revision. Just now we revised heart failure and yeah, now we revise our ECG a bit. Okay, have a look at this ECG. I have uh, enlarged it, yeah. The changes are quite obvious, but there's one or two subtle changes that some of you might miss. The, yeah, yeah, but the rest are, there are obvious changes. You can see the ST elevation, yeah. Uh, the ST elevation is staring at you, yeah. But there are one or two subtle changes uh, that you might miss. But nevertheless, give it a try. Let's see. Okay, what is your ECG diagnosis? You've got five options there. All right, okay. 
So far, everything's going for me. Okay, in fruit lateral, right bundle branch block, posterior ascension, subtle ischemia, Wolf Parkinson White. Okay, yeah, I guess that's the, is that the end? Okay, all right, okay, yeah. So most of you uh, got it right, yeah? This is uh, infralateral, yeah? Uh, uh, ST elevation MI. The ST elevation are obvious in those uh, lateral and inferior leads. Huh? You can see uh, ST elevation in V5, V6, yeah? And in the inferior lead 2, 3, AVF. What some of you might miss is actually, you notice the ST depression in V1, V2, V3. What is uh, intriguing is that, notice that the, there is a tall R. Yeah, I know the R isn't that remarkable in V1, yeah, but is tall in V2, V3. Yeah? So if you see tall R in V1, V2, V3, these are the three things you need to consider. Yeah? Number one is, uh, you know, either right ventricular hypertrophy, right bundle branch block, or even the odd wolf Parkinson white. But uh, what uh, we believe is happening here is because if you look at the ST depression, the ST depression is quite flat. Yeah? So if you were to do a posterior lead, yeah? if you were to do uh, yeah, a posterior lead, you would see that this is a mirror image of ST elevation and a Q wave. All right, okay, good. Uh, yeah, half of you got it right, but don't worry. As long as all of you can see, uh, can make a diagnosis of infralateral ischemia, I think that's good enough. Yeah, okay, we move on. All right, okay, so these are his admission glucometer uh, blood glucose 12.8, fasting blood sugar 8.3. Yeah, so uh, A1C is 8.8, .8, suggesting that uh, perhaps. Uh, the, but the uh, diabetes might have been going on for uh, for a while now. Creatinine is normal, 90. EGFR is 87, and he has no proteinuria by uh, by ACR. Uh, ECHO showed a relatively good uh, LV function with hypokinesia in the uh, areas that were affected by the uh, uh, by the uh, by the uh, infection. Yeah, uh, he's also got mal. TR suggesting a right-sided thing. Okay, we move on. Right, so he underwent primary angioplasty, standing on the right corner artery with two overlapping drug eluting stands. Yeah? And there was a diffuse uh, disease in the left anterior descending artery. And yeah? that could very well be uh, the, uh, the explanation for the lateral ischemia. Yeah? Uh, these are his medication post ACS. He's put on ACE, uh, beta blocker, statin, yeah, aspirin, and he's on double antiplatelet. Yeah, okay. Now, so back to diabetes. So his fasting blood sugar is 8.3, A1C 8.8. .8. What would you initiate for the treatment of type 2 diabetes in Mr. A and B? There are five options. Initially, there were eight options, but I had to remove the, the last the three. Yeah. Uh, one, initially I uh, put down metformin, FU, SGLT2, DPP4, all by themselves. Yeah, but then uh, nee, yeah? I have uh, too many choices. So what we have here, first, SG, uh, some, um, start with monotherapy, SGLT2 inhibitor. Some of you, um, I don't know how many of you remember the Daigami study back in the, what, back in the early, late 1990s, Daigami study, yeah? basal bolus insulin following uh, following AMI, yeah, and then you have okay, option C, combination of metformin and glycoside, yeah, the traditional uh, uh, standard uh, treatment in the last two or three decades, yeah, uh, D, combination of metformin and DP4 inhibitor, and lastly, combination of metformin as DRT2 inhibitor, yeah. So, judging by the responses, majority of you, uh, yeah, favor starting on two medication, that of metformin and SGLT2 inhibitor. Yeah? So, uh, yeah, uh, I guess uh, I'm sure you're aware that with, with an A1C of 8.1, number one, we know that 8.8, .8, yeah, uh, one single agent may not, uh, usually it's not enough to bring it down to say below seven, yeah. Uh, 
uh, in general, uh, if the A1C is below 10, you, uh, one uh, oral medication is only able to bring down A1C uh, roughly uh, about 1%, yeah? with the exception, of course, FSU and sometimes metformin. FSU can, can bring it down by 1.5 sometimes. Yeah? Uh, metformin, maybe 1%, but most of the newer agents, like DPP-4, SGLT2, yeah? even your GLEP, their, their range is between 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Occasionally, you can get 1%. Yeah? So, but of course, if the uh, starting A1C is above 10, then all you need is double the, the efficacy. Yeah? So, essentially, because of the 8.8, .8, I guess uh, that's why most of you chose to go for combination uh, with, the, well, with the view that you need two oral agents to at least try and approach 7 or 6.5, yeah? Okay, right. Shall we move on? Okay, yeah. Um, now, there's a little note there. Yeah, uh, before initiating SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, what? Uh, inhibitor ensure that a patient is stable. Yeah? Uh, blood pressure is there because we know very well because SGLT2 is uh, has got uh, is a mild diuretic, yeah, and it's also associated with about three or three point five millimeter drop in blood pressure. Yeah? So got to ensure that the blood pressure is uh, is what is stable, especially in those with heart failure. Yeah. Uh, no acute renal impairment because uh, it can worsen it initially. Yeah, stable dose are diuretics, uh, um, and I've added return of normal calorie intake. Yeah, because um, uh, in response to one of the question posed by one of you just now, I made a remark that over the last two months, uh, this is October since August, I've seen four cases of euglycemic DKA from SGLT2, two in HUKM and two in IJN. Yeah? Uh, uh, be, uh, in patients who were started SGLT2 while they were in the ward. Yeah? Uh, we have to be very careful because uh, patients who are admitted for, say, acute coronary syndrome or patients who are admitted for acute medical condition tend to have low appetite. They, yeah, they tend not to eat as much as when they were out of hospital. So that low calorie intake may predispose patients to develop ketosis. Yeah? So we have to be very careful with that. Yeah? Uh, okay, and of course, uh, yeah, uh, make sure that they are not planned for any, any intervention, yeah? any uh, procedures where fasting is required. Okay, this is a risk CV risk certification. Uh, uh, produced by uh, EASD and uh, combination of EASD and uh, ADA, yeah, uh, which shows that uh, patients with high risk, uh, those with uh, diabetes more than 10 years with target organ damage or very high risk, uh, uh, patients with diabetes and established cardiovascular disease, and yeah, as listed there, uh, uh, this is where uh, those two uh, professional bodies suggested that uh, you need to bring in SGLT2 inhibitors or GLIP 1RA uh, in order to improve the, uh, the CV outcome. Okay. And um, okay. Uh, so this is also uh, from uh, uh, ACC. Before was uh, ASD and ADA. Now it's ACC, American College of Cardiology 2018. Yeah. Uh, uh, recommend the use of uh, uh, SGLT2 or GLIP1 RA uh, yeah, uh, at the time of clinic follow up visit in patients with type 2 diabetes and establish uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, or at the time of diagnosis of uh, uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in a patient with type 2 diabetes. That means type 2 diabetes who now uh, has got a diagnosis of CVD, they uh, should also be considered. And uh, or a dual diagnosis, huh? type two diabetes together with uh, cardiovascular disease, and uh, and in patients who are admitted for cardiovascular disease. So um, uh, so whenever we initiate SGLT two inhibitors, we should pay attention to the dose of diuretic. In the past, they suggest to half the dose of uh, diuretic, uh, but then if you look at the DAPA HF studies, yeah. Huh? Uh, for example, uh, the dose of diuretic were maintained, yeah, were maintained on both sides. Those were given 
DAPA and those who were given placebo, that those of diuretic were not uh, reduced and they didn't seem to have uh, any big issues with that. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, yeah, uh, patients with hyperglycemia, they, of course, you need to uh, closely follow them up, especially those who are on insulin. Uh, because once we start these uh, agents um, uh, uh, with the resultant weight loss, uh, inadvertently, uh, they need to reduce their insulin, yeah, in dose of insulin. And our advice is normally to tell patients to reduce their prandial insulin. Yeah because uh, the basal insulin is the one that is protecting them against uh, the onset of DKA, yeah? Okay, uh, these are just uh, what, a, uh, what a guideline, yeah? Uh, suggesting how to initiate SGLT2 in patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. I think I'm five minutes over time. Uh, this is you, glycemic DKA, uh, yeah? Uh, we know very well yeah, the reason why patients with SGLT2 development is number one, uh, reduction in uh, insulin dose, number two, reduction in calorie intake, yeah, especially brought about by their weight loss. Okay? So these are the two main factors that lead to the uh, euglycemic decay. And they, this has to be recognized because some of them, a lot of them, they are, uh, they are, their blood sugar are within normal range. Yeah? One of the decay that I told you about, the, uh, out of the four that I've seen over the last two months, had a blood sugar of nine. Yeah? So nobody expected it. Yeah? And uh, yeah, even the one in CCU in IJN, the, the two DKAs, uh, the blood sugar were very low, 11, yeah? in the range of 11, 10 to 11. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, these are the factors. Yeah? listed uh, that lead to, uh, that could explain why the um, risk of decay with the use of SGLT2, uh, especially in those with severe insulin deficiency, uh, uh, restricted or reduced carbohydrate intake, uh, uh, and when they lose their weight, they, of course, they inevitably, they have to reduce their insulin doses, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, especially if the SGLT2 were not stopped, prior to surgery or prior to major uh, procedures yeah? and severe dehydration. Yeah? So bear in mind, uh, uh, guys, if you are prescribing SGLT2 for Muslim patients, yeah, we did a study a long time ago uh, yeah, uh, using DAPA uh, glyphosate, for example, yeah? uh, whereby uh, yeah, we switch uh, patients who are on SGLT2 to, uh, during Ramadan, we get them to take it during the break of fast eh? instead of uh, um, taking it at Saho because then may lead to dehydration during the 14-hour uh, long period of fasting. Okay, uh, right. Um, so these are some of the guidelines that, that have come out with regards to patients who are on SGLT2. If they're going for major surgery, uh, uh, major surgery, yeah, uh, uh, or minor elective surgery, you need to stop the SGLT2 two to three days. If a day procedure, you just need, uh, if they are coming in for OGDS, for example, yeah, or angiogram, you can start the stop the SGLT2 on the uh, in the morning of the uh, morning of the procedure. If they're going for uh, major surgery two to three days beforehand. And of course, uh, after surgery or after major procedure, you need to monitor their blood glucose closely as well as look for symptoms suggestive of DKA two to three days after uh, the major surgery or procedure. Yeah? Uh, and only restart the SGLT2 uh, once they are free intake, once they are back to eating their normal diet. Okay, These are some of the other AE of special interest with SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, of course, um, uh, hypoglycemia is only seen, uh, reported when taken with SU or insulin, yeah? And that's the reason why we tell the patients to reduce their insulin, especially the prandial, yeah? Try to uh, not to fiddle uh, with the basal insulin. Eh? Reduce the, the, the prandial if need be, yeah? Urinary tract, yeah? Urinary tract uh, infection can occur in 25 to 5% of patients. 
usually once you've treated it, yeah, 90% of them don't come back. So remember guys, UTI is not a contraindication for continuation of SAT2 because majority of the UTI do not come back. Only 10% came back, yeah. Genital infection is another issue, uh, range from five to 10% of, uh, of patients, yeah. Now genital infections, uh, of course, has to do with hygiene. Yeah? And if they get dental infection, uh, I do uh, tell them to, uh, you know, um, to uh, improve on their hygiene. And if they are able to do that, there is no reason why you should not re-challenge them with SGLT2. Talking about uh, dental infection, um, it tends to be slightly higher in patients who are not circumcised. Uh, I've always tell uh, when SGLT2 was first introduced to Australia, there were five Australian males, yeah who loved the drug so much because they were losing weight and they were controlling their blood sugar, but they kept getting this genital infection. So the five of them agreed to have, voluntarily agreed to have circumcision eh, to enable them to, uh, yeah, they are, I guess they're not used to, <laughs> to want to overclean their whatever genital tract. Eh? So they chose to have circumcision and that seemed to, eh, and after that they are happy with their SGLT2, okay? Hypoglycemia, we have discussed before, yeah, gentle infection, okay, osmotic diabetes, volume depletion. On average, the fluid loss is around 500, 250 to 500 mils, uh, an additional of one or two PU eh, going to the toilet in here. Of course, there are patients who say they have to go to the toilet up to 10 times. These are those whose blood sugars are extremely high. Eh? Okay, so, uh, yep, so these are the summary, yeah. Uh, Sorry, I've taken over time. Cardiovascular disease is still the major cause of death. Perhaps there's a shift in terms of uh, death from ACS. Now we are dealing with more deaths from heart failure and sudden, uh, sudden death from arrhythmias. Uh, and we know SGLT2, regardless of the brand or the companies, uh, uh, it's a class effect, uh, shows uh, they are quite consistent in reducing heart failure, uh, primary prevention of heart failure, hospitalization for heart failure, as well as the resultant CV mortality. Yeah? And of course, we've discussed about the uh, indication for SGLT2 for those with high risk of, uh, or uh, high risk of getting cardiovascular disease or those with established cardiovascular disease. But uh, at the end of the day, what is important is to uh, properly select your patients who will benefit from the SGLT2. To therapy. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for your kind attention. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon.